Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome as our web lecture on ensuring a democratic governance of AI, challenges and perspective. As many of you undoubtedly know, we have kicked off our third plenary session of CAHAI this morning. We already had fruitful, productive discussions on do we need regulation for artificial intelligence and what type of regulation, a binding instrument, soft law, combination of the two? Um, what do we need to understand under artificial intelligence? So this web lecture is very timely because it will present perspectives from experts around the globe and their insights will undoubtedly feed into our discussions. Now, unfortunately, our expert from Colombia, Mr. Armando Guira Español, cannot be uh, with us live today, but we have his recording and we will also uh, share it with you. Um, so I guess we can now present uh, the, the, three, uh, the two other experts who will be with us live. Yannick, can you briefly introduce them? Thank you. Thank you, Peggy, and it's my pleasure now to welcome our three distinguished guests. Deborah Bergamini is an Italian politician, manager, and journalist currently member of the Italian Parliament, Chamber of Deputies. After her master's degrees in languages, she embarked on a career as a journalist. She worked in Paris for the French publisher Analyse et Synthèse, as well from Bloomberg in London. Mrs. Bergamini entered the Italian Chamber of Deputies in 2008, and since she has been a member of the Committee on Transport, Postal Services and Communication. In November 2011, she also elected Vice President of the Inquiry Commission on Privacy and Counterfeiting. In addition to her role in Parliament, she has been serving as member of the Italian delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, PACE, where as a member of the Committee on Culture and Chair of the Subcommittee on Media and Information Society, she has been the Assembly's reporter on the governance on AI since 2019. Dr. Hiroaki Kitano is President and CEO of Sony Computer Science Laboratories Incorporated, Executive Vice President of Sony Corporation, and CEO of Sony Artificial Intelligence, Sony AI president of the Systems Biology Institute and professor at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. He is also a founding president of the RoboCup Federation, president of International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence, and member of the AI and Robotics Council and Quantum Computing Council of the World Economic Forum. He received the Computers and Thought Award from the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence in 1993, Pre Ars Electronica 2000, and Design Award 2001 from Japan Interdesign Forum, and Nature Award for Creative Mentoring in Science, in career in 2009. He was also an invited artist at the Biennale di Venezia 2000 and Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2001. Armando Guillo Espanol has recorded a video just after, uh, after this presentation. Armando Guillo Espanol is a lawyer and author of the Colombian Ethical Framework on AI. He holds a Master's Degree of Law from Harvard Law School and a Master of Public Policy from Oxford University. He has advised public and private entities around the world on data protection, high policy and innovation matters. He leads the design and implementation of Colombia's AI strategy and continues to advise international organizations on these topics in Latin America. Currently, he serves as a consultant for the Development Bank of Latin America. He is interested in emerging technologies and the ethical and regulatory challenges that come with them. He thinks that the regulation of this innovation will be one of the most important discussions of our generation and will be essential for the future of developing countries. It's now my pleasure to let the floor to Patrick Penings for the opening of this webinar. Um, dear participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the challenges raised by AI are well known by now and we should try to Go a step further and actually 
That is what we hope to be doing with this side event. The studies that have been conducted in, the 20, in 2020 in the framework of the so-called CAHI, the ad hoc group of the Council of Europe on Artificial Intelligence, but also the first findings of its specialized working group on policy development, have highlighted the transformative power of artificial intelligence on our societies and, and, and individuals, basically, and has gone further than any other technology, technological development in the past. The question, of course, is not so much the technology itself, but the use that is being made of it and the persons that are behind it. As uh, Joanna Bryson said in a seminar yesterday of the Fundamental Rights Agency, it is let's not talk about AI as a person, but let's consider artificial intelligence in its applications and look at the humans behind the machine. The CAHI will uh, hold an open discussion about the type of regulation we need uh, to frame the technology. But one thing is for sure, we need clarity and possibly further regulation and ruling. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has, in the past couple of months, produced actually seven major reports between September and October 2020 on artificial intelligence. One of these reports was prepared by Deborah Bargamini, who is the rapporteur of the report, on the need of, for democratic governance of artificial intelligence, and she will introduce the main findings of her work. If you want to harvest the benefits of artificial intelligence, we also need to create the boundaries and common rules in which it can thrive. We will also travel uh, across the oceans because we will visit Asia and we will visit Latin America. And as Yannick already announced, it's very early in Latin America and especially in Bogota now. Um, and I know that our guest from Japan, uh, Hiroaki Kitano, uh, world famous and renowned uh, expert uh, also uh, from Sony, um, has just had his dinner and uh, we're a bit of his digestif, I would say. Um, and also then from Latin America, especially from Colombia, we hope to be able to uh, invite Armando Guio Español, who is a distinguished scholar and consultant of the Development Bank of Latin America, um, whom I had a chance to discuss with uh, a couple of weeks ago about the, uh, the uh, ethical framework of artificial intelligence that has been adopted by uh, Colombia these days. But let's also not forget that our guest that has given us the opening remarks, Ms. Ms. Peggy Valka, is a professor of law and technology at my own alma mater in Leuven. She is vice dean research at the KU Leuven of law and criminology and is focused on the legal aspects of IT and media innovation. And one of the things I, I think is quite interesting as well is she is the coordinator of the so-called Just Start, which is a law incubator uh, leading law students uh, to technical startups and law firms. So these are quite interesting uh, developments. And I'm quite humbled in the presence of such distinguished, distinguished scholars, researchers, politicians, and com the combination of them. So let's get started and look at uh, what are the democratic grounds uh, to ensure proper governance of algorithms and the data used by these algorithms. So I give back the floor to you, Peggy, and to Deborah. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Thanks also for your very kind words. Um, it's amazing you picked that up. Um, <laughs> this, you start Law Incubator. It's one of my hobbies, uh, I would say. But um, I am thrilled now to give the floor to Ms. Bergamini, uh, rapporteur of the report of the Parliamentary Assembly on Democratic Governance on AI. We are very happy to have you here and uh, we're eager to listen to you. Thank you for being with us. 
Thank you very much, Peggy, and uh, really greetings from Italy to all the participants to this very timely and very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, my presence here is to also show um, a deep support for the Kahai work. I think that uh, the Kahai is doing an amazing job that I very much uh, appreciate. Uh, in any case, I think that when we discuss artificial intelligence uh, on the part of us, the legislators, we definitely need, first of all, to clarify that in any case, artificial intelligence uh, as a whole phenomenon uh, needs a coordinated approach. Uh, we, we're not able to think that we can do it, uh, deal with artificial intelligence, uh, at a national level or at a single body level. Definitely, we need a coordination. Uh, now, the question uh, is very interesting. Uh, do we need a real um, coordinated legal framework uh, to face the, the huge challenge that artificial intelligence poses to us? Artificial intelligence, and I am a science fiction passionate reader, so uh, I've been asking myself about artificial intelligence since the times of Isaac Asimov, but we all know in our daily life that artificial intelligence is extremely pervasive. It's touching practically any aspect of our life already today. So we definitely need to, uh, to treat it as a huge opportunity, but also uh, as a challenge for, for many aspects. And I welcome very much the approach that the Council of Europe Assembly uh, is taking in this sense. Uh, as Patrick was reminding, there are seven reports uh, under work uh, in the in the assembly, uh, touching different aspects of, of the whole phenomenon. And this shows uh, how much the complexity in dealing also at a legislator's level uh, with the artificial intelligence uh, is, is high. And this reminds me of 25 years ago, approximately, when the revolution of internet arrived in our lives. Uh, it looks like it was a couple of centuries ago, but it happened 25 years uh, ago, approximately. Now, what happened at the time? That this technological revolution, that of the internet, really changed deeply and profoundly our lives at a very great speed. But at the time, the legislators were not even able to detect uh, the quickness of this revolution and were probably uh, a bit lengthy or lazy, we don't know, the complexity at the time, the different aspects at the time really revolutionized also the approach of legislators that wasted time. And after 25 years, we are now dealing with that uh, lengthy processes and with that laziness, maybe, uh, with that difficulty to put up a legal framework for the internet. And today we're dealing with that. Let's think, for example, of uh, data ownership. That's a huge uh, law question, uh, a huge political question, and we're still struggling and we're still paying because we weren't able at the time to see, to foresee the importance and the relevance of being owners of our own personal data. And today, none of us is still owner of his, her personal data. So, you know, seeing it at uh, the lawmaking level, uh, with artificial intelligence, we are somehow at the same stage understanding the complexity of the phenomenon, but not really able to, to give the answer whether or not a legal framework is feasible today, whether or not is the right way, and how strict, if the, 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 the answer would be yes, how strict this legal framework uh, should be. Uh, I'm a liberal, <laughs> politically uh, thinking. Uh, so I think that the market uh, should, um, should be the winner somehow, of course, in respect of common rules of law, and, and, and that is clear. But uh, when I dealt with this report, uh, the report uh, um, that has been approved at the Council of Europe Assembly, um, with respect to the uh, government, governance of uh, the artificial intelligence, the democratic governance of the artificial intelligence, you know, I, I spoke to many experts, we had huge discussions, and in the end of the process, I think that, yes, uh, we should be able to set up uh, uh, a legal framework. Um, I think that what is mostly going on today, mainly 
self-regulatory policies on the part of uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms, let's say producers or owners, uh, is good, but it's probably uh, not enough. Why do I say so? Because uh, as uh, Patrick was reminding the words of Joanna, uh, there are still humans behind artificial intelligence uh, and algorithms. And humans are far from being perfect. And there are already cases today of biased uh, artificial intelligence application. For example, just for one example, on predictive, uh, predictiveness of crimes. Uh, we are experiencing different biases and for what concerns my report that is concentrated on how artificial intelligence affects democratic processes, we have been seeing a number of biases and a number of challenges that we have to face. I'm um, just, you know, just uh, writing down, for example, uh, misinformation, access to information uh, in the democratic process, the so-called eco chambers, and somehow a general erosion of critical thinking and polarization of political debates and not only of political debates, uh, targeted manipulation of uh, citizens' opinion and citizens' choices. We all uh, are very uh, in knowledge of the famous Cambridge Analytica case. Uh, interference from other countries in electoral national political processes. Um, some uh, cases of erosion of, uh, of erosion of civil rights. Um, so there are many issues and we know that when we discuss artificial intelligence, we are in the realm of the possibility to even predict and, and move, influence our own consciousness, our own intentions, our own opinions. And as I was saying, and I, I hope I'm not being too philosophical, but you know, we're touching the, the deep intimacy of the human aspects with artificial intelligence. We have to be very careful. And I think that we have to facilitate the setting up of a framework that must be based on, uh, on criteria that deal with ethics, ethical principles that have to do with the full respect of the fundamental rights of every citizen of the world. We have been struggling so much in past generations in order to define a framework of what are the fundamental rights uh, of every citizen in this world. We have to stick to that. We have to stick to that when we think of artificial intelligence applications. Um, and we have to remember that humans are always behind. Uh, so now if we think of artificial intelligence, applications, research and applications, we think of humans dealing with uh, uh, the, the production and the research on artificial intelligence and algorithms, humans that work for companies that have to make profit. Nothing bad with that, but we have to keep this in mind. We have to remember this when we think how and if it is enough that these huge companies apply self-regulatory principles based on ethics and all the best rules or if we need a body a global body L let's give an example like there is a the, the world um, trade organization a global body that encompasses all the position of different stakeholders uh, so that goes through multi-stakeholder um, consultations very broad to give common rules general rules based on ethics, ethical principles. And the first principle to me is that artificial intelligence must be beneficial to human beings. That's a very simple, simple statement, but we have, I think, to use simple but basic criteria when we deal with this very complex uh, um, phenomenon, technology application, let's call it uh, as we like. And, and this body uh, should help um, design, imagine, what is the correct and beneficial use of artificial intelligence and all its applications uh, to the human uh, to the human community and uh, in my report the suggestion that i put at the end of the report after analyzing uh, how much artificial intelligence is as i was saying uh, affecting the, the democratic processes um, 
I think that this a, a good starting point uh, from the part of the Council of Europe Assembly could be that of suggesting a legally binding convention to which all uh, country members of the assembly could choose to uh, they, they could choose to adopt or not to adopt. But I think that a convention uh, could be a good starting point. Now, I'm very conscious that many global bodies are working uh, and trying to find out the best approach, uh, legal and political approach to artificial intelligence phenomena. Uh, the UN through the UNESCO, the European Union is doing an amazing uh, work. Um, I have been reading the white paper of the European Commission on artificial intelligence, and that is an uh, amazing document, uh, very uh, enlightening. Uh, there is the OECD that is very active and doing a great uh, work as well. And there is, for example, uh, the, the Council of Europe, as I was saying. So many uh, different uh, bodies are dealing we are all very consciousness of the relevance and importance of getting to at least a common standard. Um, and we know very well, being legislators, that the work is, you know, the pathway is very long, but I think that it's very urgent. Otherwise, as I was um, uh, reminding beforehand, uh, we risk to have the same effect that we did have at the time of the internet, and we should definitely avoid that, or at least learn the lesson and try to do better. Yes, thanks a lot, Deborah, for, for this presentation. Uh, and again, you mentioned that uh, you appreciate science, science fiction, and for sure, it's not now a science fiction world uh, at all. And we see how oh, digital in general and artificial intelligence is able to change very quickly uh, our life. You mentioned clearly also the complexity of all the aspects that we have to face now. It's not just a new tool, but it's more a transversal impact on the world society. And I, I keep also this word beneficial. I think now we need sound evidence of this benefits. And I think your suggestion to have a legally binding convention could lead to have such maybe uh, evidence uh, now on, on the use of, of this uh, technology. Um, Peggy, uh, we are always waiting for the next speaker to come, but maybe do, we, we can ask some questions to Deborah. And for my side, I will start with that. Um, do you think that uh, the Council of Europe has a particular role in worldwide regulation? Because you mentioned OECD, UNESCO. There is a huge fear of duplication now. How do you see the role of Council of Europe? Well, thank you, Yannick, very much for this question that allows to, to me to show my deep love for this organization. You know, uh, sometimes along uh, the over 60 years of its history, the Council of Europe uh, has been considered a sort of a window on the conscience of, of Europe. And when we deal with international, with artificial intelligence, we have to deal with conscience and with consciousness. And so I think that, uh, being somehow, let me pass this word, a guardian on the respect of fundamental rights, on the rule of law, on democracy, on dignity of every single individual on earth. I think that the Council of Europe has the knowledge, the experience, the sensitivity, the sensibility to uh, use um, an approach that is very specific and it's a very human approach. And when we discuss artificial intelligence, we need to discuss at, at a parallel level human being because we are discussing a technology that is not like the internet a technology that can this is not science fiction is a real possibility take the place of every single human aspect even humans consciousness can predict can orientate can move uh, our own consciousness, our own will. So we're dealing with the core of what a human being is. So I think that the, the experience of the Council of Europe and the respect of all this, the, having the human being really at the center of its political and institutional functioning can provide a very huge contribution to how we have to deal with uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence. Look, I, I come from Italy, uh, the, the, the country of humanism. And I tell you, one of the, of the most beneficial uh, aspects of uh, artificial intelligence disrupting our lives is that it obliges each of us to ask 
who is a human being? What True. are we? What is our mm -hmm. meaning? So we get back like in ancient Greece or, or Italy to the basic question, philosophical question about the, the meaning of our identity. I know this is like philosophy, but this is the real core mm -hmm. of our being successful or unsuccessful. So I think that, you know, this era of discussing artificial intelligence will be beneficial to discussing back what a human beings are and what is their meaning. And this is what we need in a, in a society that is so quick and if you want, so superficial, so polarized. I think we will be obliged to get back to the old questions, old fundamental questions. And Council of Europe can definitely provide an amazing contribution. Thanks a lot, Deborah. Peggy, uh, I let you the floor if you have yes. also some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Yannick. Um, Ms. Bergamini, you, in your report, um, and from what you said, it's clear that the Parliamentary Assembly is a strong supporter for a legal binding instrument, so not just any type of regulation, because you clearly stated soft law will not suffice. But something that transpired during our discussions this morning was also the notion of the definition on AI. And in the appendix to your report, your very interesting report, by the way, so those who haven't read it, please, I can warmly recommend you to do so. But in the appendix to your report, you also mentioned that there is for the moment no consensus on either a technical definition, let alone um, a legal definition. Uh, so we can work with some descriptions that have been put on the table um, in various fora. But is that sufficient if we really want to adopt a binding instrument? Um, what is your view on this? Do we need to really come up with a very precise definition or would it be sufficient if we somehow describe the subject matter of the legally binding instrument like, for instance, the Council of Europe did before with the Oviedo Convention. Thank you, Peggy. Well, I think that any definition of in artificial intelligence, since artificial intelligence is evolving and changing and, you know, broadening its scope at the speed of light, I think that uh, it, it, that is true what you were remarking. Uh, it's even difficult to, to have a definition, a commonly shared definition. I think we should uh, in this phase, uh, try to um, share a broad uh, definition uh, of this so complex phenomenon. And then, you know, in time, trying to finalize. And because we don't know what what is going to happen in three months, six months from now, in terms of application and developments regarding artificial intelligence. It's such a fascinating and, you know, disrupting uh, phenomenon. Uh, certainly, certainly, uh, again, as a lawmaker, uh, I know very well that there's a sort of timidity, shyness on the part of uh, many lawmakers, because the phenomenon looks so huge, so difficult to even define and limit, that uh, the principle of prudence comes at the, you know, as the first reaction. And this is good. I think that the principle of prudence for lawmakers is always an excellent principle. But again, let's remember what happened with the Internet. Let's remember how sometimes some biases, some problems that today we're struggling with, uh, were born because lawmakers were not ready enough. So, you know, it's difficult to find the balance between the prudence uh, and the need to intervene somehow in order to guarantee um, protection to human beings from all the challenges. I know it's, it's a very difficult and long time process. There, the ability and sensibility of lawmakers is a number one must requirement, but definitely, you know, cooperation among the different stakeholders uh, is so important and experts are very important. Uh, along my report uh, construction uh, that lasted over one year and a half, I had so much benefit from discussing with experts, uh, analyzing uh, artificial intelligence from different aspects. That was very, very helpful. We need to 
reinforce these these op opportunities, these occasions as today, because that is for lawmakers precious material on which then you know uh, to to work. Grazie mille. I'm very grateful that um, you indeed highlighted again uh, the need for prudence on the part of lawmakers, but the fact that you, as well as your colleague Mr. Rick Dams. Um, uh, the, the, the president of parliamentary assembly, this, who is also a liberal, at uh, this morning also gave uh, this um, strong support for a legally binding instrument. That is um, well, that's striking to me. It means that there is really a sense of urgency. I'm happy now to pass the floor to Claudia, who also would like to raise a question. Please, Claudia. Hello. Can you hear me and see me? All right. Yes. Okay. So good afternoon to everybody. I'm sitting here in the Council of Europe, one of the rooms uh, where it all is being discussed and, and, and where it, it's all been tried. But I have a question to Honorevole Bergamini, to whom, of course, I send my best greetings. Uh, what do you think is, in, in Italy, for instance, uh, the level of awareness of debate? Uh, I'm really interested in the democracy side of it. Is this debate happening? And if so, where is it happening? Because in a very interesting report by Algorithm Watch that I read very carefully, notably on my own country, uh, it appears that the level of awareness of what is happening already as we speak um, about the decisions that are being taken um, is not very high. And what can we do, what can you do at the national level, what can we do at the international level to raise that level of awareness? Because after all, we can find the best instrument, but if there is no awareness, in the citizens that there is any an instrument, they will not be using it and therefore applications will still be harmful. So this is my question about the, how can we raise that level of awareness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claudia, uh, for your question. Um, definitely the level of awareness is very low. And somehow in my heart, I have the feeling like uh, there is a reason for that, that is something that is wanted to keep the level of awareness very low. When I referred before to lawmakers, uh, well, I could say the same thing for journalists and for the media system, and I'm a journalist as well, because I know very much that in the end, in the huge media system, artificial intelligence issues are certainly not a priority and not today at the times of COVID-19 and all the rest. So definitely, the level of awareness must be raised and must be raised urgently because this uh, technology, this, uh, this new world uh, touches every single aspect of everybody's life. So uh, we definitely have to work on this and international organization, in my opinion, can give a great help to uh, single nations. Now, at the, at the level of policy making, though, I must say that there's quite um, an interest in, in, in Italy. For example, uh, we, members of the Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence, have uh, had a huge, long meeting with the Prime Minister, Conte, a couple of months ago, a whole afternoon, discussing all different issues of artificial intelligence, and he was very interested. So, you know, uh, he is very conscious of uh, all the challenges that are posed by this phenomenon. Uh, in my commission, Transport and Telecommunication Commission at the, at the Italian Parliament, we have been undergoing a long cycle of uh, hearings on artificial intelligence, starting from the white paper on artificial intelligence of the European Commission. So there is uh, an effort to understand all the different issues, all the different aspects. There is an interest uh, and a consciousness that it's urgent to face uh, all this on the part of policymaker and government. Uh, this is very, in my opinion, this is a very good news. Uh, but unless we raise the debate as a public debate, and this is not happening yet, we will not be able to be as effective as we could already. And I guess that probably this is more or less commonly what is happening in, in the other countries, members of the Council of Europe, of course, with different stages, but more or less, I have the feeling speaking with my colleagues that more or less this is the situation. Peggy? We we yes, can continue. I can hear. We, well, yes, we can continue maybe now with Dr. Kitano, who is with us also. 
and it will be my, my pleasure to welcome him and give him the floor for a presentation uh, with uh, the point of view of Japan on, the, on this governance of artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Kitano, the floor is yours. And then, uh, let me uh, share my uh, screen. Okay, uh, let me uh, start talking about like uh, Japanese uh, policy on the artificial intelligence, like uh, uh, the strategy we had uh, like a couple of years ago, and uh, you know, so that I can talk about this. Okay, so like uh, basically, what we uh, consider is like uh, AI is very important, uh, you know, tool or technology that will shape our future and able to solve the uh, problem or the uh, major, you know, global agenda. For example, like climate issues medical issues or the uh, as well the industrial competitiveness and uh, so like uh, I don't think we have a luxury of slowing down the AI uh, innovations at the same time AI is so powerful so that we have to you know uh, treat them uh, properly and that's a basic stand and in uh, Japanese government policy uh, which I actually hammered out uh, is basically we have a three principle at the philosophy I would say is that we should respect the dignity of the individual and AI should promote and then I realized the society with diversity and inclusion and should uh, you know, achieve the sustainability of the global uh, you know, environment and uh, you know, sustainability in terms of society uh, as well. And that will actually lead to the, uh, you know, what the Japanese government calls Society 5.0 and that will eventually lead to the uh, you know, SDGs. Okay. And uh, to achieve that philosophy, we set the two, uh, four strategic goals in the AI strategy in Japan. Strategy goal number one is in the area of the human resource. Strategy goal number two is in the area of uh, industrial competitiveness. And uh, goal three is in the area of technology platform. And goal four uh, is in the area of international corporations. And I don't think I have time to go through the, all the uh, contents of the specific strategy we said, but I would like mention uh, a little bit uh, deeper into the uh, strategy goal number one in the human resource. And uh, our strategic goal, the human resource, uh, is to achieve the society education system to have an AI expert or AI, a highly AI competent people, you know, uh, in, in terms of the per capita, uh, you know, for the largest number proportion of the AI expert uh, per population, you know, five size of population. That's our goal. And to do that, we target by 2025, we should have an uh, uh, annual basis. 2,000 people of the very competent AI researchers, engineers annually, and a quarter million people, uh, uh, basically half of the college graduates, to be able to use AI for their specialty or for their business. This, uh, you know, this uh, a quarter million people it doesn't really have to be the top level AI expert, but I understand AI will be able to properly use applied AI for their own business or on their research. And then we have a half million, which is basically all college graduates, to be able to understand AI at a certain level, and they will create the uh, university level certified courses and high school uh, courses, and there will be a government certification uh, coming along. And then uh, then we have uh, going to the literacy level, uh, is one million. That means the uh, uh, it's an annual number. So like all high school graduate and all elementary school you know students will go through some kind of AI and data science and mathematics educations, and they will, in the process of reshuffling their educational courses and nationwide, and that's what we are, are trying to do. At the same time, uh, we have a, a very aggressive uh, Giga School program to provide like a, a laptop and PC for every student in Japan, and that's going uh, at a rapid speed. And that is, uh, uh, you know, kind of a strategy uh, for Japan. And so uh, with this, uh, we can have like the highest concentration not not in uh, exact you know absolute number because like uh, you know India China has a huge you know bigger population but like uh, uh, you know per size of the population uh, we aim to have like a highest concentration of AI expert okay and then uh, underneath of that or in parallel to that you know this has to be uh, done in the proper use of the AI which we said like a human centric AI and now within the uh, three philosophy I laid up. And uh, there will be seven principles for creating the AI ready society, which we call the AI ready society is a society which we can apply the AI anytime if we need to, if we need to. Okay. Uh, then our first one is human centric AI, uh, not AI centric, but like a human should be always the center 
uh, of the uh, society. That's one thing. And we should have, uh, you know, highly, uh, this, you know, uh, high level of the privacy protection and the security. And that's very important. Okay. So this is about like a safety and security I issues. And then the other side is education literacy. And this is what the government is supposed to provide is the government is supposed to provide a, a good level of education and literacy. So everyone will have opportunity to be sort of AI ready or be able to understand what AI is all about. That doesn't consider it's a black box or some kind of magic. Okay? And uh, also we need to have a fair competition in industry and fair and accountable transparent AI. And this is uh, uh, one in the uh, framework or the policy framework or a social uh, guideline, also a uh, technology to achieve this and that need to be uh, invested. And then also a very important thing is not just uh, regulating or like uh, restricting AI, what is more important the uh, innovations in a, you know, AI will be able to transform a society in a very good way. And uh, as I mentioned, so to achieve the sustainability and diversity and inclusions and in, uh, in solving the major issues we're facing, uh, we need power of AI, but not only AI, but all other technology as well in a very harmonized manner. And that's our basic stance. And also, uh, that was uh, really the government side, but also I was involved in the uh, KDAN and Japanese Economic Federation's uh, uh, vision report, which is uh, Society 5.0, so co-creating feature. I was actually a chair of the committee of hammering out this report. And of course, you know the government talking about like, uh, Society 5.0, and what Society 5.0 is basically we try to uh, achieve this by a uh, digital trans transformation, AI ready society, and diversity and inclusion sustainability. Th those are the, the uh, key uh, thing in Society 5.0. And what Society 5.0, I should mention, uh, is to create a society for, you know, various diverse group of people, diverse people, uh, people with a diverse background and a diverse talent should be able to pursue diverse lifestyle and hopefully had opportunity to be successful. And that's our, our actual definition of society 5.0. So that means that a society with high diversity and then uh, social inclusion, that's what we're aiming at. And we need the power of artificial intelligence and IC technology and other technology probably including biomedical to be able to achieve that. And then, uh, you know, if we break down uh, that, uh, you know, how to build that one, uh, as the, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, right, uh, right side of the, uh, you know, uh, slide, is the uh, we need to have like a, a quite substantial problem solving. Like Japan is suffering from aging society, and we need to solve the uh, issues coming for the uh, very much uh, the elderly population. Also, that would be the opportunity. So we need to create the value out of that. I think like uh, we take advantage of being an aging society, uh, we will solve the problem, and then other you know countries will follow. I mean that we are in the front run now in aging society, so we should find the solution and help our country to cope with it. Now, also we need a diversity in society and a decentralization and the resilience of the city and sustainability environment harmony. So this is really, you know, very uh, different from what Japan has been pursuing so far is a highly efficient centralizing uh, major cities. And we tend to have like a, a major vulnerability against natural disaster. And then uh, sustainability has been the issue. So like uh, we will flip this and uh, we're gonna, uh, in a way to transform the, uh, you know, all the national infrastructure and the way we perceive how society is supposed to be. Okay. And, uh, next step, uh, is uh, we start talking about, like, uh, you know, restarting the, uh, council or committee on the, uh, cabinet office on the, uh, you know, uh, AI, uh, human centric AI. And one of the discussion about hammering out the previous report, which you may have, uh, read, is a really term the human centric uh, uh, AI principle or, uh, you know, uh, human centric uh, social AI principle. And the discussion was uh, is human centric the right term? Because this is like a, a human centric, but like I think the things we're facing is that we are actually endangering the species. We are endangering the planetary issues, planetary resource or the climate. So, like a human centric. Well, I mean, in terms of human centric versus AI is yes, I mean, that should be human centric. At the same time, the human centric, uh, may not actually, uh, work out very well. Uh, so like uh, all the issues like, uh, you know, potential increase of pandemic is like, uh, uh, one of the side effect of the, uh, our penetration into the natural terrain. And, uh, we have like a more contact with the wild animals. And so we, uh, there's, I think a nature paper saying that we might have like a more pandemic coming years because of the, 
uh, you know, involved in the human intervention into the, uh, you know, uh, you know, habitat of the wild animals we haven't touched before. So I think like our next step will be uh, from the departure from the human centric. Human is very important, uh, but at the same time, how to widen the scope and widen the uh, view and the planetary agenda, uh, like a sustainability and also diversity and inclusion uh, and uh, everything. For example, sustainability, one of the issue is income gap. And then, uh, you know, a diversity inclusion, not just, not uh, gender or ethnic background, also like a diverse inclusion in terms of the uh, uh, regional income gap and the societal uh, gap and all that uh, uh, the issue to achieve the sustainability and help everyone to be actively participating in society and pursue the uh, style. And then also I'd like to mention, I think probably I should uh, finish uh, sharing this and then, uh, 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 one other thing uh, which has been uh, discussed, uh, I think I'll uh, stop uh, sharing, uh, is yeah, uh, one of the uh, uh, issue in the uh, AI is about like uh, uh, bias, for example. Okay, so what we actually see in the bias in the AI is if there's a bias in the data, we see that. Okay, so you know data can be from the law enforcement or business practice or other places. So, you know, in a way, so of course, like uh, if there is a seriously biased uh, AI program with the uh, biased data, you know, we should, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, control that. Uh, you know, we don't want to have like harm people by the biased training data, uh, AI system by the biased data. At the same time, a flip side of that is if we keep using AI, we'll see what in our society is biased, which we didn't notice before, because AI will make it very explicit. So, and in a way, the, you know, AI research uh, need to be extended in a very uh, different aspect of the society, so we can actually, you know, help use AI to actually expose the hidden bias which we haven't noticed before, because AI will make it very explicit. Of course, like, uh, doesn't mean that we should deploy that. We should not. But at the same time, like, uh, just simply stopping AI because it's a potentially be bias will probably hide the bias for, from us to be noticed that. So I think like, you know, AI is after all is a very powerful tool. I think like we should have a wisdom to actually make a best use of AI. And if the bias is a problem, use AI to expose the bias. So we should be able to correct the bias practice in the human society. So I think like AI will be a very interesting tool. At the same time, as a researcher in AI, we are still struggling a lot, struggling very seriously to make AI perform something we really want. I mean, there's a lot of struggle in the research, and then, uh, you know, AI is not like a magic wand. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things we want to do, but it still cannot do. And so, like, we need to push the AI technology in a full throttle, and uh, because we have a lot of problems to be solved. So, at the same time, obviously, uh, as everyone mentioned, uh, the, uh, you know, a side effect or like a, a potential misuse or inappropriate use of AI, which we have to uh, uh, make a very close uh, look at it. So I think like uh, we should have like a, a harmonization or like a, a you know balanced uh, policy uh, to be able to promote innovation in AI at the same time minimize or stop in the misuse of AI, which I think that everyone will agree. At the same time, how much of the uh, AI to be penetrated in society? How much you know uh, of, for example, like uh, uh, use in a social norm? Uh, whether how much you want to expose yourself to the data. You might have like some uh, cultural difference in a specific part of the region, like uh, in the uh, US and Europe could be slightly different, and the Japan and other part of the area might have some different uh, perspective. But I think I have like some uh, cultural difference as well. There's fundamental thing which is common to everywhere, but at the same time there are slight difference in the uh, based on the uh, uh, cultural uh, background in uh, each region as well. So I think that need to be uh, well communicated. At the same time, uh, there are things that, that we cannot compromise, and that should be the uh, universally accepted. So I think like we should have like a uh, well coordinated uh, system uh, in uh, Europe and in uh, Japan and other parts of the world uh, towards the best use of the artificial intelligence, which will benefit a future of uh, uh, civilization. And uh, I, I'll stop here, and I would like to have a, a discussion on this. Arigato gozaimasu, Dr. Kitano. Um, thank you so much for uh, making it very clear that tackling um, challenges arising from artificial intelligence is much more than simply adopting regulation. It also involves education. 
creating awareness, um, preparing citizen society for um, the adoption of certain applications that we uh, have commonly agreed that they are uh, to the benefit of humans and even not only humans, but all living beings uh, on the planet. Thanks also so much for stressing the need to find a harmonized approach, despite, um, I would say, uh, and, and leaving room for cultural differences between regions in the world. So I think your, your, what you said was extremely rich, extremely helpful uh, for our discussions. Uh, there is one or perhaps two questions I would like to ask you. The first, as I announced, um, is about what I guess is your hobby. Yeah, so Mr. Pennings referred to my hobby, which is to put students together with startups and law firms to help solve legal issues of the startups who do not yet have the budget to go to established law firms. And I guess that the Robocop is somehow your hobby. So does that somehow fit into what you mentioned in the beginning, uh, the data science education strategic goals? Is that part of it? And a second question I would like to ask you is, you mentioned the social principles of human-centric AI, but what was not entirely clear to me is how, um, what is the view of Japan on, on I would say, uh, stimulating, enshrining, uh, anchoring these principles into instruments, be it legal instruments or ethics guidelines? How is this uh, uh, dealt with um, in your country? Okay, uh, let me uh, answer a first question, RoboCup, and uh, this is, uh, I think you mean the Robot World Cup and then all the Robot Soccer game, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, it, it's not, no longer my hobby. I mean, it's like a serious research project, uh, having 45 countries, thousands of researchers getting involved, and then a uh, uh, quarter million student actually giving uh, uh, the uh, STEM education every year. And so like, uh, RoboCup is going for over 20 years, I think it's uh, I think that's one of the uh, you know the best thing I I did in my life is uh, you know when I actually heard about like uh, uh you know there's one story when I actually flying from the Stockholm to the one of the uh, I think that was Frankfurt when the Robo Cup was in the Germany uh, and when the uh, World Cup was held in Germany there's one Swedish student sit next to me and he don't know who I am and he says like hey talk to me you know. You might go into the human playing soccer, but I'm going to play the uh, robot play in the soccer game, and that's my robot. And he actually proudly told me like how great RoboCup is, without knowing I'm actually started that. <laughs> I know. And I asked him like uh, how you get like uh, decide to go scientific career. He says like I got RoboCup Junior, which is the education activity RoboCup, and I'm, oh my god, and like, <laughs> I almost cried. <laughs> okay, so like, uh, that was great. And so like I hope like RoboCup. Uh, uh, to be everywhere, I know, because a lot of scientific careers, like engineering career of general, a lot of interesting spin that as well. Like uh, Amazon Robotics, actually, the Keeper system was like an early stage RoboCup spin out, which actually transformed in the logistics industry right now. There are more to come. Okay, let me stop this. I mean, I can keep, you know, talking about this forever. Okay, a second question is like how this principle implement in the Japanese policy in terms of a regulatory framework. Okay, uh, first of all, the, uh, First part, the most important part in an AI strategy is about like a human resource. I mean, the education to have uh, not only the uh, expert in AI, but to uh, make uh, awareness or the literacy of the uh, everyone in Japan to understand what the artificial intelligence or all, all about. Uh, you know, not everyone need to be the expert in AI, but at least I understand what AI do, and then uh, it's not really have like a, some a fantasy or like a, some, uh, you know, black magic kind of image to have the realistic understanding of the, what AI is. So okay, we are transforming the education. It's a major effort going on to transform the education uh, in Japan right now. And that's, uh, that's one uh, policy implementation. It's very, very, very serious one. Okay. And then in terms of ethics, you know, I don't think we are actually not really regulating specifically for the AI because there's such uncertainty at this moment. And the most of the thing which actually going to be uh, legally problematic can be covered by the existing legal framework. Okay, so like a privacy issues, not specific AI, that will be the any of the data handling, that will be the issue as well. You know, even with the, even like a non AI system, you know, things is the same. So like a most of the thing will be covered by the existing legal framework. 
And then, uh, you know, we are very carefully looking into if there is anything specific on the AI which is not be covered and it need to be regulated in the future. So like uh, that need to be uh, well established before uh, we, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about like a hard law kind of uh, framework. I think uh, now we are having a very active uh, AI ethics and AI guideline uh, by the industry or corporate themselves. For example, like a Sony established the AI ethics uh, guideline uh, three years ago, and that was the first uh, Japanese company to establish that. We are in a very serious member of partnership on AI, uh, which the Google, IBM, and Microsoft created. Now we are very actively working on that. And that sentiment is very shared by the major Japanese company at this moment. And then also the uh, K Danding, which is Japanese Economic Bureau. I'm also the chair of the AI Utilization Committee, which is talk about uh, uh, AI ethics, uh, you know, standard utilization guideline uh, from the uh, manufacturer point of view. Okay, so the government one AI society is because it's a government that actually stipulates what the government is supposed to do to help people to be awareness on the AI and then now. Uh, you know, provide education. That's what the government is obliged to do. So like a, a Japanese business bureau, uh, Keidanden, uh, report is what the industry is supposed to do because this is industrial, uh, you know, group. And the government one is that what the, you know, de defines what the government policy framework is supposed to, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, framed around this principle. And that, that is so like a, right now, I mean, it's a uh, more software and then also like a digital uh, competitiveness uh, issues, like uh, all the big digital platformers, how are we going to uh, make them more transparent, fair and accountable. And that's another uh, major government effort which uh, we are dealing with uh, to have like, a, a, you know, uh, those uh, big platformer to be more, uh, you know, uh, transparent and obviously they're using a lot of AI behind it. So like it's uh, the digital, but it's basically digital and AI combined together. Uh, you know, we're not going to, uh, you know, explicitly regulate, but we are asking them to be fair and transparent and accountable. And then I think we'll take it from there. And then we'll see if there's anything specific we need to have like a specific legal framework if we need, rather than asking for them to be uh, fair and transparent. And then, uh, then we'll take it from there. But we've been uh, very careful at uh, putting a very strict uh, legal framework at this moment. But in the future, uh, we find something very specific action need to be taken. I think we're going to do that. Of course, I can't represent, I'm not a politician. So I cannot represent Japanese government. But as an expert advising Japanese government, I, I think that would be the way to go. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. And I'm so sorry that I was not able to join today here in Colombia in the morning. I know it was uh, early in the afternoon for you there in Europe. I would like to apologize myself with the Council of Europe, with the colleagues that, that were also part of the panel. I was really uh, excited and waiting for this opportunity to participate. But unfortunately, um, there was uh, some kind of confusion with the time schedule for this event and I missed the opportunity to share with you uh, th this uh, wonderful event and this wonderful opportunity. Uh, however, uh, the Council of Europe has been quite generous on offering me the opportunity to uh, share with you uh, the, my presentation, what I was going to talk about, especially on the a project about an ethical framework for Colombia, the first ethical framework for Latin America. So I will, I'll be glad to show you uh, what, what we are doing and I'm, I'm happy that we have this opportunity uh, and this uh, recording in a way in which we can, I can also share uh, the work of this year and what we have been doing and in which the Council of Europe has been a quite important a stakeholder participating on the roundtables that we have organized and helping us to uh, determine points of improvement of the first draft uh, that I have the opportunity to be the author of. So thank you very much. Again, I'm so sorry. I apologize for any inconvenience and hopefully we will have the opportunity to meet again with the colleagues and with the Council of Europe um, in these live events. So basically I wanted to share with you uh, this presentation and briefly to show you uh, what we had been uh, doing. So basically I work as a consultant for the Development Bank of Latin America, that is CAF. Uh, and, and CAF has been 
uh, under this umbrella of international cooperation, uh, cooperating uh, in, uh, with the co Colombian government and specifically with the presidency of the Republic and the office of the national advisor for digital transformation and economic affairs. Uh, this uh, project ideally was mainly focused on developing Colombia's AI strategy and gaining all the uh, required experience for Colombia to implement its strategy and to accelerate the implementation of the most important guidelines uh, uh, that were um, described on, on that national plan. The plan was uh, published and uh, officially published in November 2019. And the objective uh, was then to start uh, working on implementation, to deal with the challenges of implementation. And that's what CAF decided to contribute with. And, uh, uh, and, and under that framework, I was able to contribute with this first draft of an ethical framework. And one of the first drafts in the, in, in the region, the first one in the region actually, and one of the first in, in the world for Colombia uh, to have its own AI ethical principles and to define and to determine the scope of such principles. So basically, uh, as a brief context, it is very important that we consider that these principles and the need for an ethical framework was based on evidence. International evidence uh, have shown us that uh, there was an impact on human rights produced by artificial intelligence. We have seen that, so for example, in, on this research and report from the uh, from the Harvard University and the Berman Klein Center at Harvard University, they uh, studied these cases and they were able to determine the possible negative effects, also the social uh, benefits and beneficial impact of artificial intelligence, but at the same time, some negative effects of the use of technology on the criminal justice system, on the access to financial systems, and education, online content moderation, human resources, healthcare, on all these sectors, they were able to identify cases in which there were some possible negative impacts. And this was very interesting because that, of course, uh, has shown that there could be and uh, some negative consequences if there is there are no principles, if there are no ethical standards that we adopt when we are talking about using and deploying artificial intelligence. And that in Colombia, in Colombia and in countries such as Colombia is a very highly relevant issue because we want to improve the way in which human rights have, uh, are adopted and we comply with. And the problem is that if we don't consider how technologies are going to have also an impact on human rights, well, that is not going to be beneficial for uh, any of us. So this kind of evidence shows us at the same time that there were some principles and some principles that were being used in order for artificial intelligence to follow some ethical guidelines. And these were proposals that were all around the world. So in that way, Colombia is not the first country proposing ethical principles. Principles have been proposed by other governments, by uh, international entities, civil society uh, entities, and the private sector. But what we have seen is that there is a whole ecosystem of principles and that Colombia will have to define and determine not only which principles it is going to adopt, but at the same time, the definition that is going to be provided to each of them. So basically this framework proposes, and this is, as I said, a first input, the first draft that we want the, uh, that it's be used by the Colombian government in a way in which is going, going to help us to improve the dialogue that we have on AI ethics that is going to help us to have some kind of a structure uh, some kind of basis in which we can then follow on the way we are approaching to this topic. So basically what we have now is a definition on transparency, explainability, privacy. So those are the three first principles. It's interesting that in Colombia, we are defining transparency as a different issue uh, compared with explainability. So transparency is the importance of being open with the information provided, being open on the, uh, on the use of AI, telling citizens telling people in Colombia that AI is being used. And explainability goes a little bit further in a way in which it tries to explain how AI works, how the results that are being guided by this technology uh, are being produced, and in a way, how these results are having the, the impact or are having uh, some yeah, impact in the way entities, companies, and many others are deciding. 
So basically that explainability, and then I'm going to explain, we're approaching to explainability in a way in which it provides useful and, informa and clear information to citizens and to consumers, for example, but in a way in which it isn't going to create a very highly expensive use of AI. We want explainability until a point in which it will be cost benefit efficient, but, in the, but we don't want to increase costs of using and adopting technologies in Colombia because we are requiring a, a highly explainable system. And especially when we know that there are black box systems that can provide huge benefits to society, but does, that is still have very difficult or even in some cases, not as uh, 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 understanding or, 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 or being explainable for all of us, even for the experts on this on this area. Then we have privacy, and in this way, we are not just reinforcing something that has been already in place in Colombia. Colombia has a very robust data protection uh, law, general law, and in that way, this framework is not replacing or in a way changing what the law is saying. It's just reinforcing this idea that privacy has to be one of the core issues and principles that must be embedded in the way in which AI is being uh, designed, deployed, and, and used in Colombia. At the same time, we're having these other three principles. It's human control, yeah, human oversight, or what we call human in the loop and human over the loop. So it's very interesting because this has helped us to show that the that AI and in countries like Colombia, AI is still under the control of humans. We cannot believe this idea that the AI will decide by itself, that AI will be implemented by itself, but that humans are deciding on the way in which this technology is being used, the data that is this technology is, is trying to, to uh, help people decide. And in that way, it is just a tool. It is something that we are is, is still under control, and we provide as much autonomy as we desire. So, in here, in, in, in this case, I'm following, for example, the the, example, the, the case of many, uh, and proposals of some countries, like the authorities in Singapore. We believe that based on a risk assessment, we can have a human control, a human over the loop, in, specifically in some cases in which there can be some uh, negative consequences, or at least there is the risk of those consequences to have a huge impact, especially in society, and that is still requiring this human oversight. Uh, on the fifth point, and sorry that there is a mistake there, it's about uh, security and safety, not explainability. Explainability was before that. Uh, so basically what we are talking about on this fifth principle that is security, I, uh, this, uh, sorry for this uh, uh, mistake here, but basically what we're talking about security is that we're talking about protecting humans and considering the huge impact that can be received if we have the artificial intelligence systems working on, on the way in which security is not considered. And especially if we consider that physical integrity and the physical harm now that can be produced with the with AI system. So that's something to definitely consider. And there is a new idea of safety, not just about digital safety, digital security, but also of physical harm and how physical infrastructure can suffer if if there is not there are not proper security measures that must be in place, especially when this technology has a, an, uh, can considerably affect physical infrastructure. Then accountability, of course, and following the other principles, there has to, someone to be accountable on these issues. We believe that, for example, Colombian citizens have to be able to uh, find someone accountable if there is a negative consequence and people producing these systems have to be accountable on the way in which they are developing, designing, or even implementing the technology. And this is, has been quite important because something that is innovative perhaps, or at least has been seen as something very interesting of the Colombian proposal is that we have considered that those entities or individuals implementing or deploying the technology in the country are also responsible and accountable of the effects. We cannot just blame designers. We cannot just blame developers. We also, in that point we consider that there, that people implementing and especially in countries like Colombia where we believe that we first of all we will be high consumers of the technology we will not be uh, uh, producers we expect we're doing uh, 
many efforts on becoming experts but on, uh, and, and developers and designers of this technology, but mainly we will receive products and services using AI that have been developed in other countries, but that does not excuse people in Colombia about the use they are giving to this technology and the way they are deploying the, te the technology in the public, private sector, and many, many other areas. So this is a very important principle on that respect. Then we have these four last principles, non-discrimination, inclusion, prevalence of the rights of children and adolescents, and the social benefit. So basically, non-discrimination following uh, universal principle of non-discriminated people, and race, religion, disabilities, age, or sexual orientation. Inclusion, we want to improve inclusion. That's why we consider, for example, explainability to be of such an important uh, relevance for, 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 for Colombia. Uh, and then two that had been quite uh, new for the digital ecosystem and technology ecosystem in the region and, and, and in, in the international scenario. And it's first of all, it's the first ethical framework that is having a principle specifically on the prevalence of rights of children and adolescents. We consider this to be of high importance and that these, we have to do better efforts on including this population into the into the way in which AI is being used, deployed in our countries. We have to do better efforts on, on doing that and on every single system to respect the importance of their rights. And at the same time, on a social benefit perspective is that we want that to do an extra effort and people deploying these systems in Colombia to show and to at least consider how a social benefit is being produced by this, by this technology. So there's a toolkit of principles, and this is also interesting because we now have here that we're going from principles to how to implement them. And here I'm not going to extend myself, but basically there's a, a series of, of, of tools that we can use and mechanisms for, for, to materialize, to operationalize these principles in society, in public entities, private entities, and many others that want to try. And basically this is a proposal. This is not the, 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 the final toolkit that Colombia is going to adopt, but it's a proposal. And we can see how each of these uh, mechanisms has an impact on helping the country and entities to achieve uh, each of the, uh, the implementation of each of the principles proposed. So we have algorithm assessment, data cleansing, a smart explanation and mechanism to achieve a smart explanation that is cost benefit efficient, differential privacy as a way in which we can improve the privacy protection. And we have, we have also considered uh, enforcing education and research strategies uh, and in a way promoting more research on the ethics of AI and research in Colombia about this topic because we have seen a lot of international resources being used, but we still need our own perspective and their our own academic research can be important. Ethical approach to, to, to data or what we call the litmus test, the personal data stores, the privacy impact assessments here, the GDPR is, has proposed some uh, mechanisms that can be quite considered on, on, on the way in which this ethical framework is being implemented. And of course, strengthening this idea of the business and human rights um, concept and the way in which those kind of projects can also involve, for example, on, the, on a business and human rights perspective, the ethical use of AI. So basically the framework proposed a series of recommendations. One of them was especially to use this as a document that will help to develop a wider conversation and deeper conversation with Colombian society and with different entities, and not only with Colombian entities and individuals, but uh, international entities. So for example, as I already mentioned, the Council of Europe was highly uh, important and participative and has been involved on the way in which it has participated on the round tables we have had on the, on, on the discussion of, of, of this first document. And this was one of the main strategies. We also considered that the ethical framework was going to be important, uh, especially uh, for sectors as the public sector, and it was important to consider and the Colombian government to consider how to implement it and how to uh, provide some kind of binding force or, uh, or yeah, or, 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 or for it at least to be on, on a way, something that public officials, for example, should consider in the way they're implementing this technology in Colombia. Now, what, what we think is that we have to have the, this, this kind of discussions, discuss the framework, make changes, continue with this kind of public, uh, uh, public process of 
having comments, having suggestions, implementing the, the, the framework, training people on the framework, on the ethical principles that we propose, evaluating it, how it is being adopted, and iterate, make changes accordingly if necessary. So, as I mentioned, we have the opportunity to publish this document and the presidency of the Republic of Colombia, the government finally decided to publish the document in August 2020 to adopt some of these recommendations. And now we are on this process of improving what we consider is a very important and relevant point that is the governance and ethics of, of, of AI. It is not a matter of having a good result on this kind of uh, index, for example, on the government AI readiness index. It's a matter also of having the best uh, uh, deployment of the technology. And in the same way, as you can see, Colombia has been leading the vision, has been considered by the, this uh, kind of index in, as an AI star, a, a rising star. And this is because the policy has been comprehensive, the com is, is holistic on its approach, has been uh, helping Colombia to achieve uh, uh, or to become a very relevant country on the use of AI in Latin America. And we want to promote that kind of leadership and we want to promote the use of this technology, but also the responsible use. And that's why we are also very concerned about this kind of measurements and the way in which we are going to, to be responsible on the use of AI in the Americas. So we also have considered this sub-index developed by the IDRC and Oxford Insights in a way in which we want to increase and if we are becoming leaders in Colombia and in the region about the use of and the responsible and use of AI, we want uh, and on the use of AI by itself, we want also to become uh, leaders on the responsible use of AI. And that's one of the most important points that we want to become leaders on. And that's why it is so important to continue working towards this um, uh, purpose and this specific objective. So basically, that was going to be my presentation. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And again, sorry for any inconvenience. And hopefully, we will see each other next year. And we will uh, share uh, many of these uh, points. And hopefully, this will be not a virtual or uh, event, but will be a, a event in which we will be, be present on the same room. And, uh, and and thank you very much again for all the opportunity, all the uh, support and how the Council of Europe has uh, provided us a platform to show what we're doing in Colombia and has considered this to be a very important uh, project. And we really appreciate that kind of, um, of support. So thank you very much. And, um, and hopefully you uh, were able to see and like this presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to pass the floor to Mr. Pennings, who also has one would like to raise a question. Yeah, yes, it, it's a question, but also more of a remark because Hiroaki Kitano basically uh, gave us a little image of Society 5.0. And basically, it tells us something that is to instead of trying to regulate and deal with, with what is now and trying to anticipate what is coming, is to, and that joins Ms. Bergamini's vision, maybe science fiction vision of the future, but it is basically saying, uh, what type of society do we want to create and how does artificial intelligence fit into that? Because basically that is what is going to define what we want to do and not to do. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that is very, very interesting because we've, we, we've started maybe too much. If you start speaking science fiction, we've maybe started too much from Brave New World and, and uh, Aldous Huxley and, and George Orwell with 1984, which I was happy to read before 1984. Um, but I also read another book of George Orwell, Orwell which was Animal Farm. And I think uh, what is important is that we define, and, and Mr. Kitano already tried to do that, what, what type of society, sustainability, diversity and inclusion, uh, human-centric, democratic governance, the type, the, the, the topic of our debate right now. And maybe more than an, a George Orwell describing Animal Farm or 1984, we may, maybe need another 
Thomas More and describing a an utopia and trying to see what type of society can we possibly create and do we have an opportunity to create with the advancement of technology. Now we're, we're at the time of the Festival of Lights and um, Mr. Harari would have said, well, if you imagine uh, the future in a science fiction mode, you will probably be wrong. But he said you will be more wrong if you look at it from today's perspective. And I think Mr. Kitano invites us a little bit to that. That is to look at what is the type of society that we would maybe in a utopian way look at and how can um, the new technology, the artificial intelligence help us to get there. And that's, that, is the, that is a fantastic perspective because it gives an open new vision that invites us to become Thomas More rather than George Orwell. And that, I think, is quite challenging. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a very nice uh, comment. I think uh, that's exactly uh, right. I mean, I think we need hope, particularly when we're actually suffering this uh, pandemic and uh, people need hope and the society need hope. And I think uh, artificial intelligence not going to be the magic thing, but like, I think it would be a very powerful tool uh, to transform society with a post-pandemic society. <clears throat> and in a, in a decent democratic society, I think we can have like a really harmonized, uh, decent control over AI, or rather than the control, the promote AI in the uh, best use of the technology. And of course, like, uh, you know, other part of it, I wouldn't say which part, but like, uh, uh, there are probably a possibly a serious misuse of the technology to monitor the, uh, you know, all the humans, uh, you know, people uh, on the street uh, in uh, ill intentions. But like uh, in uh, most of the decent, uh, you know, democratic society, I think, uh, uh, you know, we have a much better chance in uh, having AI in a better use and for the beneficial use of AI. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kitano. Uh, thanks a lot also to Deborah Bergamini. I think, uh, Peggy, we are beginning to, to running a little bit late, and maybe we, we can go slowly to the conclusion. Uh, and uh, before to give the floor to Claudia Luciani for that conclusion, uh, I would like first to, to thank again uh, Dr. Kitano and the support of Japan for the organization of this webinar. I would like to thank Parliamentary Assembly and Deborah Bergamini for her presence. It's priceless. And uh, again, uh, your report uh, will continue to disseminate uh, the, the findings uh, in our work uh, at the CAI and on the website, of course, of the Council of Europe. And Claudia, I think it's slow, slowly time now to, to conclude that, that webinar. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yannick. Not really to conclude, but just to give my takeaways. It's been a fascinating, although short, but in an hour, you have made us travel, uh, both of you, um, both in time and space. And that's what I certainly like to do myself. Now, when it comes to timing, I was very impressed by what uh, Deborah Bergamini said about are we on time and wh why were we not on time 25 years ago? I think this question remains in my mind, to be perfectly honest. And are we in the winter or the spring of AI? This you never know. I don't want to be taken by the hype of, you know, these robots coming. But the question of timing is extremely interesting. And I think, in a way, Council Bureau tries to respond to this question by trying to be right on time. And so is her report, and so is Parliamentary Assembly, as we've just said. So there is a partial answer to her question. And uh, there is also elements of answer in what she said about uh, wanting to work in a collaborative way with other international organizations. We took the point, but uh, knowing that time is ripe for that. And of course, Council of Europe is trying, as we speak, to uh, make its own contribution to this question of having some kind of approach that will reap the benefit of AI and and um, and take care of the, of the harmful application. Um, then, of course, uh, it was fascinating to hear um, Mr. Kitano uh, on those. Uh, first of all, I find a connecting point between what um, Deborah Begamini said about the awareness of people about AI and this fantastic plan Japan has uh, with those impressive numbers of how to turn the society into AI competent citizens, because I understand this is the uh, basic element in order to make them 
make choices that are based on knowledge and therefore democratic choices. So I see a huge link between what you said about uh, your absolutely fabulous plan to have uh, all high school students uh, with the knowledge of AI and, uh, and make experts of graduate students so that they can use it in their own fields uh, and be uh, competent with it. I find that absolutely striking uh, the, to, to the core of what we're speaking about. Uh, without that knowledge and literacy, we will not have competent citizens. I also absolutely um, and, uh, love the, the, your definition of human-centric. Uh, because it takes us this, uh, to this new uh, 5.0 society. But what I must say impressed me the most is when you spoke about uh, human-centric not being enough and wanted to go for planetary agenda that includes other types of intelligence, if I understood, or this is what I would add to what your very interesting words, because animals have intelligence too. And, and uh, artificial is only one of the kinds of intelligence we're dealing with. So I see uh, that your thinking takes us to a planetary agenda and uh, this is absolutely fascinating uh, because it's probably the only way to make it sustainable uh, in the future. Um, and uh, I also want to um, emphasize what you said about pushing the research to do uh, to of AI into the direction that it can maybe hasn't been pushed enough in to help us um, find that bias that exists in our society. Uh, of course, the question remains what you do with it then afterwards and takes us back right full circle to a governance mechanism that can certainly be entrusted to democracies and not to non-democracies. <laughs> so my ending words would be that we come back full circle to uh, democratic principles being at the heart of whatever we do with the eye. Because we don't have those, then the decisions are definitely going to be harmful for our citizens and not beneficial. So I want to thank you both for absolutely uh, fascinating journey. Uh, into this question, and that gives us even uh, newer perspectives for the work of the Council of Europe. So, thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Welcome. Bye.